Hi everyone, if we can take our seats, please. That was my teacher's voice. It's really <laughs> Fantastic. I think it's good to start on time because we've got lots of people online who can't share in the hugs and kisses that seem to be going on in the room. Fantastic. All right, so my duty, hi, I'm Alice McDougall. Um, I head up, I'm lucky enough, to head up the charity law team here at Herbert Smith Freddie Hills. Um, firstly, before I welcome you properly, I want to, on behalf of all of the speakers here, um, acknowledge and pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land we are on. And I want to stand beside all First Nations people in supporting the statement from the heart and um, strive for truth, treaty and voice. I want to welcome you all here. It's very exciting to be here in person. I particularly want to welcome John Emerson. Um, and I also want to take this opportunity to thank John for changing my life for the better. Uh, I've got the microphone, so I'm just going to publicly say it. 23 years ago, John introduced me to the wonders of charity law. I have been smitten ever since. <laughs> Um, and I really have not had the opportunity to publicly thank you for that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have learned obviously so much from John, as has so many people in the room and online, and we are very grateful for that. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Steve King Fung, who is the chair of the uh, Law Council of Australia Committee for Charities and Not for Profit. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, I would like to add my welcome, you know, to Alice's and also to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Friends and colleagues, it's really good to see you here today. Um, the first of this oration was held in 2019 in honour of, in honor of John, you know, Emerson um, AM. This is the third oration we missed in 2020 because of that virus. And this year, this event is a joint um, event with um, the Charity Law Association of Australia and New Zealand, which has always um, had an annual lecture. So this year, we have combined the oration and the annual lecture um, together. I'm really also pleased this afternoon that Jeff Promise, you know, so who is the chair of the Law Council of Australia's legal practice section, is here with us too. Um, such being the times that we are in, I've never actually met Jeff in person until he walked in the door earlier this afternoon. Welcome, Jeff. It's great to have you here with us. We also have the pleasure this afternoon of Sue Woodward AM, who is here with us after her first day in the office at the ACNC. <laughs> Sue, we are really honoured that you can be here with us today. Welcome. And of course, we have John Emerson here with us too. I knew John from the beginning of my legal career. My first job was actually with the firm that was then known as Freehill Hollandale and Page, now Herbert Smith Freehills. And it was also John who actually gave me my first, I think, idea of charity law. You know, so he had the corner. I was a very junior first year lawyer who always used to look and wonder what John was doing with all his tax you know, legislation and files and files, you know, <laughs> lined up, you know. So um, John would have been one of the firm's, you know, longest serving partners, you know, when he retired in 2019. And of course, many of us also know him as a member of the Board of Taxation and a number of other legal and public sector communities. John has retired, but all, almost all the lawyers I know who practice and advise charities and not-for-profit organisations today continue look up, to look up to him as the expert. 
Professor Anne O'Connell delivered this oration last year and reminded us that, you know, so do many academics, you know, all look up to John Emerson as well. John is a member of the Order of Australia for services to law and to the community, particularly through the provision of advice to charities and not-for-profits in Australia, as well as the development of public administration reform to encourage philanthropy in Australia. We're still talking about those things today, aren't we? John, thank you very much for laying those wonderful foundations for so many of us. It's been wonderful to, um, to work together with Associate Professor Ian Murray, Chair of the Board of Clans on this event, and I now invite Ian to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, Seeking. Um, and I'd just also like to start by paying my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation also. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Una Brin, who's come all the way from Ireland um, to talk to us tonight. And um, the title of the presentation that she'll be giving is Regulatory Reviews, Revolutionary Reimagining of Charity Law, or Simply Restatements of Convenience, which I'm, I'm quite interested to see which side she lands on um, in delivering this talk to us. Now, most of you know that Una has um, got a long history of research uh, in charity regulation, including comparative charity regulation. Um, she's an expert in regulation and governance um, and a graduate of both University College Dublin and Yale Law School. Um, she's currently the president of the International Society for Third Sector Research, ISTR, and in 2021, um, she had the enjoyable uh, opportunity of being appointed as chair of the Independent Review of Charity Regulation in Northern Ireland. Uh, and um, the report that she worked so hard on was very happily finally published earlier this year, so we can all read that report. Um, she's also written a book uh, called Regulatory Waves, Comparative Perspectives on State Regulation and Self-Regulation Policies in the Nonprofit sector with Alison Dunn and Mark Sadell, which takes a comparative look at regulation in this space. So we really couldn't ask for anyone better qualified than Una to come and talk to us about charity reviews um, and uh, what some of the issues might be with those reviews. So Una, it's an absolute pleasure to hand over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. And before I begin, I would like to express my sincere thanks to both the Law Council of Australia and to the Charity uh, Law Association of Australia and New Zealand for inviting me to deliver the third Emerson oration and the third public annual lecture of clans and for bringing me halfway around the world uh, to do so. On a personal note, I would like to record my own appreciation of John, who during my Ian Potter fellowship days back in 2016, welcomed me to Melbourne in his role as a board member of ACPNS, and who kindly then accompanied me to the ACNC when I was sharing my research findings with the regulator. So it's a great honor to be here, John, and lovely to see you um, again. I called this talk Regulatory Reviews revolutionary reimagining of charity law or simply restatements of convenience. Let me start by setting the scene. Almost 20 years on from the regulatory wave that brought with it new charities acts and new charity regulations in many common law jurisdictions, charity law review is in the air again. But this should be so is perhaps not surprising. The English, Australian and Irish Acts all commanded a statutory review of their respective legislation within a five-year period of commencement of those Acts. And while not statutorily obliged, political promises of review, so Scotland, New Zealand and Northern Ireland all embark upon regulatory reviews in 2019 and 2020 respectively. With such a spate of charity law examination occurring, what can we learn from each other? Are there critical issues that arise in every jurisdictional review? Or are some matters simply too hot to handle? How independent, open and collaborative are those processes? And to what extent have these reviews actually informed charity law reform in the various jurisdictions? 
And as vested stakeholders in that process, what are the takeaway for us lawyers, both academic and practitioner, on our roles in these important reform processes? Review processes invite us to reflect and consult upon the effectiveness of existing practices and to propose new ways to improve the regulatory framework, either through legislative or policy change, or change in administrative practice or sector practice. Understanding the life cycle of a regulatory review brings value. It alerts us to the strengths and the weaknesses of this evaluative model, and it may provide food for thought in future design processes when we come to review. So, to date, while many jurisdictions have embarked upon the review process, few, apart from England and Wales, have actually crossed the finish line. It's hard to be definitive, therefore, as to the time required, other than to say it usually takes longer than originally anticipated. In England and Wales, from the appointment of Lord Hodgson in November 2011, to the passage of the 2022 Charities Act, which gave effect to the remainder of his recommendations, the review process, all told, has taken more than a decade. December 2022 marks the fifth anniversary of the start of the Australian legislative review process. And while the Australian government published its formal response in 2020 to the 2018 recommendations of the McClure Commission, the road to legislative reform has proven to be a rocky one to date, with the Senate's rejection of the government's proposed amendments to the governance standards in November 21, and perhaps relatively less progress on those other recommendations accepted by government than one might have hoped. Worst in class is Ireland, where the Charities Act 2009 mandated a statutory five-year review of the Act's operation. That five-year review passed in 2019, but the government has ignored this review requirement and the Charities Bill is now pending in its absence. Jurisdictions that are not statutorily compelled to review their charity frameworks enjoy greater flexibility as to timing and focus of reviews. Two such reviews, New Zealand and Scotland, have been government-owned and run. The third, Northern Ireland, is the exception, where the Minister for Communities appointed an independent panel, which I had the honour of chairing. The varying speed and scope of these review processes raises interesting questions about the effect of government ownership. In Scotland, Oscar's 2016 targeted review of charity regulation would seem to mark the starting point of what has been a six-year process to date. The 10 areas of operation identified then were refined to six in Oscar's 2018 modernisation paper, which in turn informed the Scottish government's consultation processes in 2019 and 2021. Since then, the Scottish Government has published two analyses of the responses received and in late November this year introduced the Charities Regulation and Administration Scotland Bill, quite a mouthful, in Parliament to give effect to these recommendations. In the space of just four years, New Zealand has gone from publication of terms of reference for its charity review to a Charities Bill currently before Parliament. Now, seasoned commentators will note that the very absence of a statutorily mandated process gave the New Zealand government power in November 2012 to postpone a then promised full first principles review of the charities legislation in favour of this more curtailed approach in 2018. In Northern Ireland, the panel began work in January 2021 and its report was published a year later in January 22. Despite political instability following the summer elections, which have ultimately led to the dissolution of the Northern Ireland Assembly uh, in that region, ministers occupied a caretaker role for six months. And one of the last um, acts of the Minister for Communities before she was removed from office was to issue her formal response to the panel's report in October of this year. So, lesson number one. Review times vary immensely. Crossing the finish line and stopping the clock will depend on a number of factors, including, but not limited to, whether amending legislation is required to give effect to the recommendations, as has been proposed in all jurisdictions to date, or whether further research or consultation is required, as happened in England and Wales with the use of their Law Commission. 
A further critical responsibility is whether the policy window remains open post the publication of the review, a factor which is often influenced by whether there's been a change in government, this has been the case in New Zealand, or in Northern Ireland's case, a lack of government, or how palatable the government finds the recommendations, particularly where the review is independent of government. While every review process is to some extent bounded by place, political context and culture, regulatory review life cycles have five essential phases in which ultimate success is predicated on how well previous stages have been managed. Much can be learned from comparing and contrasting the various jurisdictional approaches. The terms of reference are the first stage and they set the scope and may expressly or implicitly place certain matters beyond the remit of the review panel. Their framing is always political. Language matters and the considerations that inform the drafting of the terms of reference and the stakeholders who influence their development are critical to the review's outcome. Where a review is statutorily mandated, statutory provisions may play an important role in the shaping of the remit. In England and Wales, Section 73 of the Charities Act 2006 prescribed five specific areas to be considered, along with the catch-all proviso that the review could cover any other matters that the minister considers appropriate. That added another 14 onto the slate. In establishing Lord Hodgson's remit, his terms of instruction um, um, instructed him to take a broad approach to seek to address three issues. What is a charity and what are the roles of charities? What do charities need to be able to do in order to deliver those roles? And what should the legal framework for charities look like in order to meet those needs? Interestingly, his terms went on then to tell him, note, however, that formal recommendations should relate only to the third of these issues. In Australia, Section 16 of the 2012 Act mandated a statutory review of the ACNC, and it gave the Australian government great freedom in framing the issues for consideration in its 2017 terms of reference. It settled on four main areas, the Act's relevance, the effectiveness of the regulatory framework, the sufficiency of the regulator's powers, and the amendments necessary to achieve objectives or deal with the emerging issues identified by the review. Now, this last area allowed the McClure Commission to consider and make recommendations on the regulation of fundraising, an issue of deep concern to the sector, but not one otherwise expressly mentioned in the terms of reference. In non-statutory reviews, the factors that motivate and shape the terms of reference may be very different. In the case of Northern Ireland, two factors precipitated the independent review. Firstly, a 2020 finding of the Northern Irish Court of Appeal that the charity commissioners were the body corporate and they did not have express or implied powers to delegate their functions to staff acting alone. This decision put in question more than 7,000 decisions of the regulator, many relating to charity registrations, and they resulted in the suspension of the charities register in Northern Ireland. The second factor was the undermining of the sector's confidence in the regulator's effectiveness and in the department's oversight following a series of challenges to the proportionality of the commission's decision making and its communications with charities over a number of years. Now, these factors, these catalysts, in many ways, focused uh, the terms of reference and they focus the panel's attention on its fitness for the purpose of the existing regulatory framework, the Commission's engagement with stakeholders, and the Department's fulfilment of its role and responsibilities in developing, delivering, and communicating regulation as set against best international practice. The Minister appointed the panel in January 21, and the final terms were agreed in February. This allowed the review panel to engage with the Minister around those terms, and to ensure both clarity of purpose and the deliverability of the ask. I believe that this constructive approach around the framing of the terms of reference was key to the successful completion of the review process there. New Zealand's 2018 terms of reference appointed the policy group of DIA to lead the review. Matters relating to the regulatory framework, 
registration and deregistration and the obligations of registered charities were placed firmly within the scope of the review. The terms of reference, however, expressly excluded the definition of charitable purpose, the scope of charitable taxation, exemptions, and the regulation of non-profits more generally. For its part, Scotland skipped terms of reference entirely. It moved directly from Oscar's discussion paper to the government's consultation process. And it's very interesting that in both of these jurisdictions, New Zealand and Scotland, charities called for more broad ranging review of charity regulation, something both governments have promised to engage in sometime in the unspecified future. Lesson number two tells us terms of reference matter. They shape the ultimate direction and the review's outcomes. A review panel is thus both corralled and shielded by its terms of reference. The process is very much a political one and a policy one, and one I hope to return to later this evening. Stage two is the public consultation phase. And when we come to this, good communication around the purpose of the consultation and the targeted engagement with stakeholders is really key. Review panels need to hear from a wide variety of affected parties. Managing public engagement is key. It's a real challenge, as it's not enough to simply put the right people in the room together. You have to ask the right questions of them. In Northern Ireland, we spent considerable time preparing consultation material for what turned out to be virtual community meetings, thanks to the pandemic. We also developed an online questionnaire to gather submission responses, and we held 20 key stakeholder meetings. We met with charity regulators and government departments, not just in Northern Ireland, but in other jurisdictions. We met with large, medium and small charities, funders, accountants, lawyers. We also met with the public and those who had experienced the full gambit of the Law Commission, Charity Commission's powers many who wish to share their views with the panel on the need for reform. Those listening exercises were in addition to our online consultation, although participating in a webinar provided a good basis for then completing the questionnaire. Our secretariat prepared transcripts of all of the community meetings and catalogued their views so that these remained live to the panel throughout its deliberative process. And this is really important because sometimes groups will come to a webinar or come to a meeting and then not fill out a submission themselves. And you don't want to lose that richness. The importance of gathering community views was equally strongly valued in Australia and New Zealand, where in both instances, the McClure Commission and the DIA went on tour, physically meeting the public over a course of 27 meetings in New Zealand in 2019 and numerous round tables in Australia in 2020. Whether virtual or in person, the importance of community meetings is critical. Such gatherings allow you to hear from those most affected by the legislation, and they provide an opportunity for insight, hearing issues, and hearing at times frustration. Being heard is a really, really important part of the process. In terms of consultation, two key takeaways here relate to the consultation duration period and also submission publications. In terms of duration, most jurisdictions generally allow six to eight weeks, both for holding the stakeholder meetings and accepting written submissions uh, to enable the consultation to continue. There can be a tension between facilitating a timely gathering of information uh, to enable the review and also giving the public sufficient time to understand the issues at stake and to express their views. Consultation deadlines are capable, however, of movement. In New Zealand, lawyerly interventions rallied over 100 New Zealand charities to successfully petition the Social Services and Community Select Committee to extend by one month the period for public submissions on the New Zealand Charities Amendment Bill. Official publication of submissions is also a very valuable step in ensuring transparency and accountability of the review process. And it's something that's been followed in every jurisdiction to date, except England and Wales, where no official channel made these submissions available. Often publication is normally subject to the consent of the respondent, and it usually occurs after the review is concluded. 
Respondents can, and of course do, publish their submissions independently so that they form part of the marketplace of ideas during the course of the consultation phase. One interesting twist to this is the fact that the ACNC's response to the Australian review was published in January 2018, which was midway through the submission process. While the publication had the advantage of putting the ACNC's views on the record and allowing it as an important stakeholder in the process to be heard, the downside of this early mover advantage is that there is a risk that submissions occurring after this date may respond more to the regulator's brief than to the broader issues raised by the review panel. This can alter the course of the reform conversation in terms of what issues are emphasised or perhaps not discussed at all. Turning to stage three, which is the report itself and the recommendations made, one notable feature of commissioned independent reports is that they generally deliver in a timely fashion. Both Lord Hodgson and the McClure Commission delivered their final reports and recommendations within eight months of their respective appointments. In Northern Ireland, it was 12 months from panel appointment to publication of final report. A second distinguishing feature between independent and government owned reviews that becomes apparent at report stage is that independent reviews tend to have a higher percentage of recommendations that are aimed at the reform of the charity regulator, whether in terms of its administrative practices or its general engagement with the sector. One possible explanation for this is that in the independent reviews, the regulator, while a key stakeholder and participant in the review, is actually fully scrutinised as part of the process. Arguably, it's easier for an independent panel to objectively evaluate the regulator's practice with a view to improvement than it may be if the government is essentially reviewing itself. In government-owned processes, the regulator often enjoys favoured player status, whose views inform the agenda before others are asked to comment. We can see this in the Scottish and the New Zealand processes, where the review processes both began life with position papers from Oscar and DIA respectively. These set the review stage and in turn influenced the level of scrutiny to which the regulators were subjected in the subsequent consultation processes. This harks back to lesson number one, terms of reference matter. To put some numbers on this by way of illustration, of the 103 recommendations made by Lord Hodgson, 44 specifically focus on the Charity Commission, and the vast majority of them are what might be termed practice and procedure recommendations that seek to change existing regulatory practices, whether through requiring the Commission to provide better guidance to charities or altering the way in which the Commission engages with the charity sector. A similar pattern is found in Northern Ireland. 57 of the 93 recommendations are directed towards the Commission, with 52 centering upon its regulatory approach and culture, its engagement with the charity sector, and the prioritisation of its regulatory functions. Turning to Australia, of the McClure Commission's 30 recommendations, 10 focus on the ACNC, with five of these recommendations specifically addressing the ACNC's priorities and regulatory approach. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in independent reviews, between one half and one third of recommendations have tended to be regulator focused. This outcome can be contrasted with New Zealand, where of the 21 legislative changes being proposed by the Charities Bill, five relate to the practices and procedures of Charity Services New Zealand. The Scottish review process has just recently advanced to proposal stage, and similarly to New Zealand, the focus there is on the functional elements of charity regulation, what information is held by the regulator, what appears on the register, what the reporting requirements are. Where Oscar is concerned, the thrust of the bill is to provide it with new or wider powers in the investigation of charities. Perhaps this outcome should not be surprising, given the government's concession in its 2019 consultation document that the issues highlighted in this consultation mainly derive from Oscar's proposals. Turning to stage four, which is the government's formal response to review processes, 
In independent reviews, unlike their government-owned counterparts, we require a formal government response, but the timing is never immediate. In England, the Cabinet Office issued an interim response four months after Lord Hodgson's report was received, but the formal comprehensive response took 15 months to come. The British government, for the most part, welcomed his report and rejected 10% of the recommendations. In Northern Ireland, the minister's formal response to the report came nine months after the poor report's publication. With the exception of one recommendation, the minister accepted all of the recommendations of the independent panel, either partially, fully, or subject to further consideration. The one area where the panel and the minister disagreed was that the requirement of um, the requirement to register. The panel recommended that all charities should continue to register, whereas the minister indicated in her formal response that following the intense lobbying of the sector, only charities with an income of in excess of £20,000 would be in future required to register with the regulator in an effort to ensure an ability of charities to attract volunteers. In Australia, 18 months elapsed between the publication of McClure's Commission recommendations and the government's formal response in March 2020. Here, however, the government rejected almost one third of the recommendations it received. In contextualising the government's willingness, or perhaps lack thereof, to accept the Commission's uh, recommendations, Senator Sajila wrote in his introduction, since the government tabled the panel's report in Parliament, I have consulted extensively with the charity sector, the community and with state and territory ministers to understand their views on the panel's recommendations. I believe our response will result in a better balance between reducing red tape for charities while ensuring trust and confidence in the governments. These words echoed the comments made by the senator the previous year when speaking at the 2019 ACNC regulatory conference, he referenced the consistent messages from the charity sector that he was hearing firsthand as he developed the government response to the review. And yet, many of the issues for which the sector had campaigned were not amongst the recommendations accepted by the government. The government rejected recommendations to amend Australian consumer law to clarify its application to charitable fundraising or to introduce a code of conduct for fundraising. It also rejected outright the proposal to introduce ACNC test case funding to enable it to develop the law in matters of public interest. When we come to government run reviews, the task of ascertaining uh, outcomes is much more nuanced. One has to track very carefully the starting and ending points of the process in order to discern the government's action points as opposed to its talking points. In New Zealand, the DIA's 2019 discussion paper raised the management of risks where charities carry out unrelated business activities as an issue of concern. These matters were subsequently explored in targeted stakeholder engagement, yet when the, when the regulatory impact statement in 2021 was made, no recommendations were included in this area. Similarly, while the topic of advocacy merited a full chapter in the discussion document, by the time of 2021's regulatory impact statement, we learned that the minister had agreed to narrow the scope for modernization work, excluding advocacy, so that results could be delivered for the sector during the parliamentary term. Thus, issues identified at the outset can and often do get lost in government processes of government-led reviews. To some degree, Scotland mitigated this hazard by producing a policy memorandum when it introduced its Charities Bill in November. The policy memo sets out the issues upon which the government consulted and it links those issues back to the bill's proposed legislative changes by referring to the level of respondent agreement on the matters during the stakeholder consultation, which is an interesting approach in attempting to have some accountability for where you're headed on the legislative frame. The final stage concerns post-review implementation. Now, implementation can take many forms. Legislative reform, whether by way of new or amending legislation, 
or the introduction of new statutory regulations is often needed to bring radical change about. And it can be a slow and uncertain process, as we all know. Non-statutory recommendations involving a change in a regulator's administrative practices, or perhaps better communication of regulatory rules, may be quicker to implement. Nevertheless, tracking the implementation of these recommendations can be more difficult in the absence of specific report back obligation on the part of the regulator. In England, none of the annual reports of the Charity Commission since the publication of the Hodgson Report reference the recommendations directed to it. The ACNC refers slightly better. In its annual report for 2021, the Commissioner's introduction nodded to the legislative review with references to the ACNC's work with the government to amend the definition of basic religious charity and the introduction of st and governance standard six to provide an incentive to charities to participate in the national redress scheme. Conscious of the need to be able to track implementation, the independent review in Nor Northern Ireland recommended that the department should monitor the implementation by the commission of agreed recommendations flowing from its report. And the minister accepted this recommendation as a key way to ensure transparency and accountability. In advance of the minister's formal response, the Charity Commission itself addressed the review's recommendations in both its annual report in 2022, but also in its business plan. And it made a commitment in that latter plan to publish information in the annual report on the progress in terms of achieving the recommendations taken forward. Aside from direct statutory fixes, whether statutory or non-statutory, a government may decide to refer a matter to its law commission for further consideration, particularly if the matters at hand are legally complex. And this approach was built into the English review process from as early um, as the law commission's 11th programme of work, which preceded the Hodgson review. So they were already looking forward to the fact that this work would need to be taken forward elsewhere. Following Lord Hodgson's specific referral of certain issues and the government's acquiescence in these areas, the terms of reference for the charity law project were drawn up in June 2013. They started with social investments, and this was given a much higher priority, but it did result in the Charities Protection and Social Investment Act of 2016. In 2015, the Law Commission came back to the remaining recommendations of the remaining areas of a technical challenge. And its project in 2015 involved a comprehensive consultation, exploring 100 questions across a wide variety of charity law areas. The Law Commission published its report, including a draft charities bill to give effect to its recommendations in September 2017. These recommendations were warmly welcomed by Lord Hodgson, and he noted that while they appeared highly technical, they would cumulatively have a huge impact on the sector. And he voiced his hope that there would be a speedy implementation by government. It took four more years for the government to accept the Law Commission's recommendations, but these did give rise to the Charities Bill, which became the Charities Act of 2022. So, while it took almost a decade from the publication of Lord Hodgson's initial report to their ultimate implementation in the 2016 and 2022 Acts, they are now law. A possible precedent down under lies in New Zealand, where New Zealand's recently enacted and broadly welcomed Incorporated Societies Act of 2022 also originated from a New Zealand Law Commission report in 2013. Tasking a law commission in its programme of work with charity law reform stemming from a regulatory review can keep the policy window ajar after a review is published. And it may assist with keeping alive important questions that require legislative change, but may not otherwise hold political attention long enough for that achievement to be brought about. The law commission route might thus be described as the slow but steady tortoise in the race towards legislative change. 
when we come to certain themes that are cross-cutting across all jurisdictions, one might focus on the likes of the regulator's powers or registration issues or requirements for deregistration. Many reviews also focus on embedding proportionality and accountability into the regulatory asks made of charities and the practice and procedure of those various regulators. In practice, it's fair to say that in the time-limited environment that defines most review processes, review panels will seek to deliver on the low-hanging functional fruit. Certain regulatory problems lend themselves to resolution in a review process. They tend to be tangible, albeit sometimes complex or technical in nature. They are often matters more of a regulatory uh, good practice issue than necessarily matters central to charity law. They may be matters on which government may be pleased to have a review body make an objective finding on which needed reform can be based. Across the jurisdictions, a popular recommendation often relates to the setting of financial thresholds for regulatory reporting processes. The revision of reporting burdens formed a core set of Northern Ireland's panel's recommendations aimed at lessening the reporting burden on smaller charities, simplifying reporting across the board, while maintaining the integrity of the charities register by mandating that all charities should be registered. Similarly, in New Zealand, the DIA recommendation which was accepted by government to exempt tier four charities from tier four reporting obligations when the compliance burden on those charities will be disproportionate to the level of transparency needed also came forth. The Australian government for its part also accepted in principle the recommendation of the McClure Commission to raise the revenue thresholds for minimum reporting requirements so that fewer charities will be required to file financial reports. And this has now been given an um, effect in amended reporting regulations in 2021. Providing enhanced or new powers to a regulator, as well as recommending greater delegation of powers by a regulator where another suitable body exists, also often feature in review recommendations. And for the most part, they're well received by government. Recommendations on the removal of powers entirely from a regulator per se tend not to be so welcomed. In Australia, for instance, while the government was happy to accept uh, that the ACNC should have power to collect and disclose data, it did not accept recommendations from the Commission to repeal Governance Standard 3 or to remove the Commissioner's power to remove and replace a responsible person. That brings us to the harder nuts to crack when we talk about charity review processes. These are the somewhat more perennial issues that just appear too hot to be handled in the context of charity review, such that even if an independent review makes a recommendation in these areas, the government tends not to accept them, or even if ostensibly raised by a government-owned review, these matters tend to be deprioritized as the process advances rendering them essentially policy orphans. A good example of one such issue is the definition of charitable purpose. The New Zealand Review is a case in point. The 2018 Terms of Reference specifically excluded discussion of definition, adopting a narrower approach than the aborted First Principles Review previously proposed in 2010. Charities had advocated for a review of the definition in the context of the sector's perception that DIA's conservative approach to the definition of charitable purpose had narrowed the gate for successful regulation as a charity in New Zealand. It's noticeable that even though the 2018 terms expressly excluded this matter, respondents to the review unilaterally raised it in their submissions. This caused the Minister's officials to note in their 2021 briefing to her the strong public interest that the concept of charitable purpose can prompt. While they still remain steadfast in their advice to her that it should remain firmly excluded from consideration. New Zealand's experience is not unique in this regard. In Canada, in the mid-1990s, 
a non-profit sector driven voluntary sector round table sought to develop mechanisms for dialogue with the federal government. The VSR can culminated in the publication of a report which was known as the Broadbent Report. And it led in turn to the, in the starting of the voluntary sector initiative in which government and the sector came together around six joint tables to explore ways of strengthening relationships. Charity definition fell to the joint regulatory table. It reported in 2003, and noticeable was the lack of recommendations on charity definition, an issue that had been prioritised by the voluntary sector. Placing the blame squarely on government representatives, Cathy Brock identified officials' unwillingness to share policy making in this area. She said, and I quote, the federal government agreed to review these items internally, but would not discuss them jointly, which almost caused the regulatory table to collapse. These areas signify the inability of government to reconcile the tension between a desire to have organizations more fully involved in policy design and delivery, and to accept organizations in a critical policy advocacy role. The relative failure of the joint regulatory table there, when compared with the tangible success of the other joint tables, implies that the problem lay more with the subject matter of the table than with the effectiveness of the collaborative process. In Ireland, a similar 2000 government white paper proposal to utilise a joint implementation and advisory group comprising government and sector representatives for charity regulatory reform never materialised either. Indeed, the charity regulation unit of the responsible department reclaimed the task of charity regulation reform early on um, in the process, much to the annoyance of the voluntary sector representatives involved. This pattern of non-engagement with the sector on regulatory policy matters has continued with the Charities Act 2009 with the government's failure to carry out the statutorily required review of the Act's operations. A new Charities Bill is now pending, and it's a little bit of a mixed bag in that it increases regulation on charities in a number of areas that are not perhaps very welcome. But the one win of this Act is the introduction of the advancement of human rights as part of the definition in charitable purposes. Now, this win by the sector comes after two failed legislative attempts to make this change in 2014 and 2018, and eight years on from a report of the Joint Oireachtas Subcommittee recommending its inclusion. It's noteworthy that this subcommittee was not a charity committee, but a human rights one, and that's what has ultimately made the difference. In England, while Lord Hodgson raised the issue of charitable definition, his treatment of the matter in his report is more rhetorical in nature. His review did not propose any changes to the list of charitable purposes there. And while rejecting the Kalman proposal for an introduction of a UK-wide definition of charity, he did go so far as to say that harmonisation remained desirable. Speaking on the mismatch between the public's perception of which charities are, which organisations are charitable and the reality, Hodgson noted, it does point to the need for an important wider debate between and among Parliament, the public and the sector around whether charities should be limited in their activities or where the boundaries of definition should lie. The Public Administrative Committee its post-legislative scrutiny report of the Charities Act picked up this gauntlet that had been cast down by Lord Hodgson and it explored whether charity boundaries might be better defined with clearer public benefit legislative guidance. It ultimately recommended that Parliament must legislate to clarify the flawed legislation on the question of charities and public benefit. The government, however, rejected this recommendation in its formal response in 2013. A similar veto um, discussing the charitability uh, issue emanated from the English Law Commission. Writing in 2014, at a time when Lord Hodgson's review had passed the baton of technical issues to the Law Commission, 
Though Commissioner Elizabeth Cook noted, and I quote, in line with the general approach of the Law Commission and consistent with its independent status, we are not addressing matters of political controversy. In particular, we are not consulting upon anything that would change the definition of charity. This does raise the rather troubling vista that issues which are viewed as politically controversial should be passed from one state institution to another without anyone actually engaging in the deliberative and informed policy debate that these critical matters require. While we may now all have statutory definitions of charitable purpose in our jurisdictions, one might argue there's less political willingness to embrace the civic responsibility which comes with such power, both to ensure and engage with the sector and engender good debate on the statutory evolution of charity law and its regulation. Briefly turning to advocacy as an issue that has also caused issues in regulatory reviews. Outside of its acknowledgement as an important issue for a sector independence, advocacy didn't feature in Lord Hodgson's 2012 report. And while the PAC devoted some time to exploring the levels of political advocacy, it decided in 2013 that neither side of the conflicting evidence it had heard was compelling. And thus it made no recommendations on changing the rules on political campaigning by charities in England and Wales. New Zealand's discussion paper put the issue of advocacy firmly on the discussion table, noting that the Act provided little guidance on when charities should advocate for causes, with the key precedents being common law ones. Over 200 consultation submissions addressed the issue of advocacy in New Zealand, making it the third most popular substantive topic amongst respondents to the consultation. Notwithstanding this, in February 2021, as I've noted earlier, the Minister removed advocacy from the slate of ongoing policy development in order to pass an amendment bill during the parliamentary term. Our officials briefing noted, while these topics can be constrained, their very nature potentially raises more fundamental questions. Overall, we recognise that excluding topics might disappoint some sector representatives, but leaving room for a further stage of work that could be picked up on, on those issues from 2018 may help mitigate concerns. So, advocacy in New Zealand fell outside the review, despite it being an issue on which government acknowledged and the sector evidenced needed clarity. One might ask whether a fundamental issue of this nature couldn't have been referred to the Law Commission, as in England, and for further consideration. While not making a direct recommendation on the nature of advocacy itself, the McClure Commission recognised the ambiguity that exists around the threshold between issues-based advocacy linked to a charitable purpose and activities undertaken to achieve a political purpose that would be a disqualifying one. It recommended test case funding be provided to the regulator to enable cases to be taken to clarify the law. Unfortunately, the Australian government preemptorily rejected this recommendation in its 2020 response, noting that it would instead explore legislative options to address uncertainty in the law. Now, I focused on advocacy and on charitable definition, but one could equally include in this area, and I won't because time won't allow, the issues of fundraising regulation or tax policy as issues also that have not prospered in review settings, particularly where we have multi-issue reviews, or perhaps are never given a fair airing in the first place. And so where do lawyers fit then in this process of reform? Lawyers have the ability to translate the practical difficulties experienced by charities into the underpinning legal issues or practices at the heart of the problem. The ability to demystify technical issues and make them accessible to broader public understanding is important in a process that relies on public input and public submissions. Not every country is blessed with an organisation like Justice Connect, 
or indeed like with lawyers like John Emerson, whose contributions to the policy debate have been key. But many lawyers serve in pro bono capacities on the boards of both charity representative organizations and on charities themselves, as well as providing professional services directly to charities. In Northern Ireland, for this very reason, we arranged a separate community meeting specifically to speak with the lawyers in the charity sphere and to hear their special concerns. The role of lawyers on review panels is equally important. In Australia, two of the four panellists were lawyers. Lord Hodgson, himself a non-lawyer, had the support of a senior partner at a leading charity firm in his cabinet team in England. While in New Zealand, membership of the core reference group supporting the DIA review included a charity lawyer and two members with law degrees. Apart from contributing to the submissions process, Lawyers play an important public role in ensuring that sufficient time is granted for equitable input into consultation periods. And special mention here is made of Stephen Moe and Sue Barker, two clans members whose leadership saw the extension of time in New Zealand for the consultation on its charities bill. In Australia, it was equally heartening to see the, the submissions of the Law Council of Australia, the Queensland Law Society and clans amongst many other lawyerly submissions, opposing the Australian government's proposals to amend Government Standard 3. Submissions that all contributed to the proposal being defeated in the Senate in November last year. I think there is another important area where there is room for lawyers to improve the policy arena for charities. And that is in all of those difficult areas that I spoke of earlier. We need lawyers to tackle the difficult questions that our politicians are shying away from. We need lawyers to think through and untangle the perceived problems and offer an array of policy solutions so that when the policy window opens, solutions, and there may be more than one, are often ready for consideration. Many of the areas I've touched upon as being too hot to handle politically have not been successfully tackled in any of our recent multi-issue reviews, whether we're speaking of charitable purpose or advocacy or fundraising regulation or tax issues. Outside of the review process, we should be using both the formalised process of the law commissions and the more informal but nonetheless important process of individual lawyers, whether academic or practising starting and contributing to the policy debate and being willing to pick apart a knotty charity law problem and share their insights. Monitoring implementation is equally important, whether through parliamentary questions or through ongoing engagement with the charities regulator, as in clans support of the regulator's annual Regulators Day. This helps to keep the regulator accountable for its oversight of charity law. And this will be particularly important in all of our jurisdictions in the future, since none of our Charities Acts have introduced a follow-on statutory review clause for future reviews of our charity legislation. Lawyers, therefore, must continuously ask the childlike question, are we nearly there yet? Of both our legislators and our regulators until the finish line is crossed. So in closing, Regulatory reviews have the power to be revolutionary reimaginings of our charity law frameworks, but this is not an automatic consequence of their establishment. The road is long and momentum can be lost at any of the five stages that you've journeyed through with me this evening. If we're serious about moving beyond restatements of convenience and tackling the more difficult policy issues that arise for the betterment of society. It will take a team effort, and lawyers are critical players in this policy quest. Many thanks for your attention. Well, thank you very much to Una for taking us on that road trip through charity law reviews, the potential flaws um, the regrettable tendency to perhaps focus on issues of um, technical rather than, uh, rather than substance, um, but also um, opening our eyes to the possibilities for 
practical actions that we could take. So I just hope the Australian Law Reform Commission is ready for the <laughs> array of emails it's going to receive later this week. Now, I think, um, Alice, are we able to spend a little bit longer having some questions? So, are there some questions that we can um, hand over to Una? All right. Una, thanks very much for making the long trip and then taking us on uh, not so long a trip. Um, if the meaning of charity is too hot for political hands to handle, uh, does that take us inevitably to the courts? But um, with the in inherent problems of the charity sector of being able to resource itself and take on the risk of an adverse result at the frontiers of the law? That's a very good question, Marie, and thanks for raising it. I think one of the difficulties is the way in which charity definition has been raised in the context of what I've referred to as multi-issue reviews, because it's so much easier to tackle other issues than the harder questions. But that doesn't mean reviews should be thrown out when it comes to difficult questions. If they're going to work, they have to be focused. You have to take away all of the other distractions uh, that allow a commission or a review panel off the hook. And the one example I would give you, and I think it's a very successful one here, is the charity's definition inquiry, which was very much focused on definition. And if you read the terms of reference for that report, it says very clearly, leave the tax matters aside. That's not your job. Your job is to focus on the hard issue of definition. So that can be a really valuable way because you're absolutely right. Cases don't come to court very often. And there are very good reasons for that. Charities don't have the money and they want to protect uh, their reputation. They really don't want to be up there in those lights, nor should they need to be for the law to move on. Particularly when we've gone down the statutory route and we're not dependent upon the common law for advancement. Hi, Una. My name is Bridget Cowling. In your research, you, you averted to um, the fact that the ACNC review said, let's get rid of Governance Standard 3, and then the response from the government was, let's double down on Governance Standard 3. How often does that happen in the research that you uh, have done in all these reviews? I think the Australian one was probably, it's a really nice one for academics to go on for when you're teaching students because it is very extreme in that sense. It goes in exactly the opposite direction to what the Commission intended it uh, to go. It's hard to point to other views where you get such a, an extreme example, but you will find, um, you will find governments reviewing the recommendations with an eye to their own agenda. And we must never forget the reason why that is the case because the review process is a political process at heart. It starts with government and it ends with government. So they raise the starting flag and they choose what they want to hear at the end of the process. And that's why I believe lawyers are extremely important here in keeping government accountable for, particularly if they say, we're doing this on your behalf, you asked for this. It really does require lawyers to step up to the mark and to be ready to say, not on my watch, that's not what we were saying, and, and to clarify the record in that regard. Thanks for the presentation, Una. Um, what's the most revolutionary change uh, that you've seen resulting from one of these reviews, and what was the the, the, what were the settings that allowed that change to occur? That's a great question. I'd say you'll have to ask me that question in another 10 years' time, because as I said, the only one across the finish line at the moment is England and Wales. Um, and the questions that they asked in their review didn't relate to sort of the startling areas, perhaps where we're most interested in change, advocacy, charitable purpose. There were recommendations on fundraising regulation, which I know is always a big area in many jurisdictions, but it was a case of keep your hands off and unless you really have to get in there, which is not that helpful uh, to the rest of us that are trying to move this issue forward. Um, is there one that I would point to as having the potential to be um, 
game changing. I think it would be very interesting in, in Northern Ireland, and I suppose that's the one that I, I know best. Uh, we were we were quite flattered to get such um, a number of our recommendations accepted uh, by the ministry. You don't expect to get 99% over the finish line, and it looks great on the surface. Um, a lot of our recommendations related to the culture of the Charity Commission, because that informs the relationship. And I think if we really want an enabling space for charities, we have to reach a good accommodation between our regulators' requirement to have oversight of a sector and space for charities to have all of those um, attributes that we associate with a good charity sector, the plurality, the diversity, the innovativeness that comes from being allowed to do your own thing outside of the ranch. Uh, that's really, really important. Um, and I, I think in this regard, it will be very interesting to see how the Charity Commission in Northern Ireland, which is already looking at our recommendations, advances its relationship with the sector. And I think perhaps we won't have to wait 10 years for that. We, we should start to see change if they're serious about accepting our recommendations. And I'd be really proud of that if it happens in Northern Ireland. Other questions for Una? I'd warn everybody out here to give them a chance. <laughs> Well, um, maybe given time, we should um, thank Una again and hand over to see So, Una, thank you so much. I'll hand back over to C. King to um, close the, the evening. Oh, you did that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll follow instructions. I'll give you a gift, which I hasten to reassure you now is very um, compressible and very light. <laughs> Thank you very much, Una. That was um, eye opening, lots to think about. Um, before we wrap up, there are, I know there's some refreshments, you know, at um, back of the room. I just want to thank the following people, Alice McDougall, you know, and also Priscilla and Hera, who was here helping with IT earlier. And of course, you know, Herbert smith Friels for hosting us this afternoon. Um, thank you very much, Alice, for making this possible. Um, and I hope you can express our gratitude to the partners of the firm. Um, at the Law Council of Australia, she's not able to be with us this afternoon because she arrived from Canberra on um, Friday to attend some Law Council meetings and has spent this whole time isolating in her hotel room. You know, Chelsea Di Silva, you know, many of you have heard from her on emails, you know, as you registered for this event. So I know Chelsea's online. So thank you very much, Chelsea. And we hope that next year we can have you with us in person. Um, I also want to say thank you to all my colleagues um, on the Charities and Not-for-Profits Committee for conceiving of this event in 2019 and supporting the, um, the committee and its work so well. You know, so every year I look back, um, last week I just produced a report to the um, LPS, you know, um, executive about our activities. Um, we've actually done so many um, submissions again this year and also had conversations with ACNC and others as well through the year as we think about regulation of this sector. So thank you very much. Thank you one and all. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>